Good evening. It is good to see all of you here. So I welcome you here this evening. I welcome those who are joining us via live stream. And I especially welcome the congregation in Pasadena, California, All Saints Episcopal Church, who have joined us in this book read of No Ashes in the Fire and who are joining us tonight live stream. We are so very honored to have with us this evening Darnell L. Moore, the author of our first semester book read here at EDS at Union, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. This book won the Lambda Book Award for the Best Gay Memoir and is listed as one of the 100 notable books by the New York Times Review. Darnell, for now, serves as the head of strategy and programs for the U.S. Office of Breakthrough, one of the leading human, human rights organizations, organizations in the world. I say for now because he has just accepted a, the position of Director of Inclusion Strategy for Content and Marketing at Netflix in that. He's helping to change the world, y'all. He is also our cross the street neighbor, for he is currently as well writer in residence at the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice at Columbia University. He's previously served as a visiting fellow and visiting scholar at Yale Divinity School and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at New York University having also taught at a number of other institutions and universities of uh, schools of higher learning. Darnell worked with Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tomete, the founders of Black Lives Matter, to organize the Black Lives Matter's ride to Ferguson in the wake of Michael Brown's murder. And he worked with them to develop the infrastructure for the Black Lives Matter network. He is widely published in various media. If, and if I were to list all of his well-deserved awards and honors, well, we'd be here all night. There are, in fact, so many more things that I could say about Darnell Moore. But the one thing that I really want you to know about the person that I have come to know across the years is this. Darnell Moore is a man of deep integrity with a profound love and respect for the sacredness of all humanity. The passion that comes off of the pages of his memoir is the passion with which he lives his life, for he is passionate about the love that is justice. And so I have learned over the years that you never have to worry about Darnell showing up when it is time to stand up and fight for the sacred dignity of another. He shows up even when no one else does. He shows up because he is committed to making sure that no one's life will become ashes in a fire. It is with profound respect for all that he is and all that he does that I present to you this evening my brother, and I hope I can call him friend, Darnell Moore.
I think it's <laughs> impossible to follow such a beautiful introduction. Um, and I would be, re re be remiss to not start by publicly thanking the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. I did this uh, in a sort of private conversation that we had, but I, I wanted to do it publicly too. Um, one of the reasons why I'm literally able to stand here is because of the works um, that have been the grounds for my survival. One of the books that literally saved my life was Kelly Brown, Kelly Brown Douglas's book, Sexuality in a Black Church. And I was wrestling, not even wrestling, trying my best to live while a seminary student um, during the years of 2004 to 2007 when that book showed up in my life um, and gave me reason to live. And as a writer, you know, it's often is the case that we write words that we hope can land gracefully in the sort of hearts and laps of individuals that we imagine writing them for, and certainly your words landed in mine. So thank you, and thank you to the community for inviting me to be part of this conversation, for selecting this book. I'm really honored. I used to study in, this, uh, in the library here because Princeton was too far away from Elizabeth where I was living. And um, I just would run here because I was just so jealous of the curriculum. <laughs> I was at Princeton Seminary and I'm like, those union folk are really doing it big. And um, it's really an honor to be back here. Thanks for your generosity. So what I thought I'll do today is a mix of just offering some meditations and a mix of reading. I don't want to bore you, so I, I didn't even write like a formal keynote in ways that I typically would. Um, I just wrote little notes for myself. But I want to reflect on this thought on writing a spiritual memoir. And I actually never really thought about this book as a spiritual memoir uh, until Dr. Douglas <laughs> described it as one. <laughs> Um, but I want to talk a bit about confession and costly grace and radical love. I'll open with a reading from a chapter that is titled Unbecoming. And I should, before I do that, let me just say a big thank you to my editor, Katie, who's here. Katie O'Donnell, raise your hand so they can see who you are. Um, and my publicist, Brooke. Um, they've really helped me down, and a re the reason why this book has been able to do what it has done in the world has been largely in part to their stewardship of it, so thank you. My knees hit the linoleum floor of the campus music room. My hands were folded in front of my face, blocking the brightness of the lights, and penitent words fell from my lips. I was alone, unmasked, and disarmed in God's presence. My only connection to the world outside the room was the always locked windows offering a glimpse into the darkness outside. Use me, I pleaded, in spite of my feelings and failings. In that same room when it was full of mostly black students who found solace and support among community, I would stand upright and admonish my peers to live righteous lives, to renew their minds, to run away from sin and to be examples of God's love. But now on my knees and alone in prayer, the words I had preached haunted me. How could I profess what I felt to follow? Help me, God. Help me to be better. Help me to live right. I still believed my skin, my bones, my hands, my eyes, my feet, my penis, my heart, my desires, and my flesh were dirty and needed to be purified. All had been touched by yet another man I secretly loved. My longings weren't wrong, but I denied them as if they were. The theology I accepted, the idea that I must subdue my most human desires in pursuit of divine perfection, even if it meant self-deception, was wrong. I had gotten used to the newfound admiration. Some Christian communities believe that men, however righteous or damaged, are the leaders of the church and the home. So they give us opportunities to represent the congregation. My community had chosen me. Finally, 
I had landed a win in the game. If my peers refused to accept me because my brand of hood antics was too dramatized to be legit, or if they turned their heads because my attraction to men was too excessive to be cast as normal, then I would reinvent myself into a black man worthy of their respect. I would become clay in God's hands. My prayers with a fire lighten, lighten the cam. I had been there before. A few months earlier, I found my way into a random church in Newark and fell to my knees. I was prepared to take jabs at my soul in the name of a stern God, a father who demonstrates love for his creation by demanding they submit to punishment. And if they are unsuccessful, the punishment he will meet is eternal separation from his love. I bent before a God who is the judge and the warden holding the keys to liberation who seem to have always benefited the masters and never the enslaved. I've been remorseful before when I convinced myself my wrongdoings would determine the extent to which I would be loved or not. I had been there, broken before God after I had broken the rules that should not have been, been in place at all. The church had harmed me more than it healed me, but I stayed because I had become attracted to self-debasement. I stayed on my knees. The church seems to prefer those believers who move about in degradation, never those journeying forward with heads held high. I had attended a revival in a church in Newark a few months prior to being in the music room. I knelt in the dim light that penetrated the graphic stained glass windows. On my knees, I prayed the same prayer and shed tears. I was not alone, but I was lonely. The visiting preacher organized a prayer line. The repentant souls took our places in the line, ready to be ushered into ecstasy of the spirit. I was desperate to rid myself of the fire within. No more sex with men. No more loving men. No more jerking off wet dreams, chat lines, threesomes. No more deception. No more sadness, shame, mental exhaustion. If God heals according to our faith as I was taught, then surely God could make me into the man I willed myself to become. I closed my eyes in expectation. The preacher placed his heavy hand on my head. The sweat on my forehead mixed with the holy oil and both mixed with my tears as he prayed fervently into a microphone. I rebuked the demonic spirit of homosexuality terrorizing this brother's life. My eyes were still closed, but I was no longer raptured. I was aware that everyone in that packed sanctuary now knew the secret I hadn't shared with anyone. Was it my dress or demeanor or was it his listening eye, was it his discerning eye that moved him to say aloud what I had welled in silence? Get out of him, demon. I fell to the floor and felt several pairs of hands on my back. I ended up under a pew with thick spit foaming from my mouth. A mind tortured by hate can produce haunting effects on the body. The only demons in that place was a psychological deception cloaked under the guise of Christian love. The prayers continued. He will walk in his purpose. He will live according to God's will. He will be free, the preacher uttered. But I thought I already was. So I'm opening there. Um, because one of the sort of organizing principles around which this book was written is the notion and practice of confession. In many ways, the book is a testimony, it's a witness account, a sort of excavation of an emotional genealogy or history, a prayer, a lamentation, a praise song, a scream, a whisper, a word spoken back to power, an intervention, a reclaiming of my tongue, a pointed indictment, a coming clean. I wanted to write the truth. And one of the things that I learned very early on after having read um, this interview that Ta-Nehisi Coates had given, he was talking about writing a memoir. And the, the interviewer said, so what advice would you give to somebody writing a memoir? And he said, to not fucking lie. <laughs> it's not easy to tell the truth. Um, so I want to say a bit about how hard it was to write a book where uh, a big part of my thinking around it had to do with confession and had to do with truth telling. 
And what does it mean to tell the truth in, the, in a society, in a country, in a world where we are so attracted to lies? You know, we lie to make ourselves, to make ourselves feel better, yeah? Um, and I spent a lot of time, I think the biggest, yeah, it, it took, I spent a lot of time, but I also um, wrestling with what it meant to sort of put a life on the page that was in many ways no longer hidden. And not only to talk about the ways in which I may have experienced this life that I was going to narrativize, but also allowing people in and to sort of confess the ways in which I too had not only been uh, a victim of, of, of many of life's circumstances and, and of life's, uh, the structural sort of oppressions that had impacted me, but I'm like, am I ready to talk about the shit that I've done? Am I ready to lay myself on the line um, and come clean with the ways that I too have had my feet on people's necks in ways that people have had their feet on mine? Y'all know that's not an easy task. As a memoirist, I think there's this grandiose idea that we approach the task of either telling our stories as if we are either fully the victim or the hero. Never the in-between, never the gray, and that's sort of like our imitating life. Isn't that how we live our lives? Y'all quiet. I mean, it is the case that we are really, really, um, so many of us seem really, really able and eager to name the feet that are on our necks. You know what I mean by that metaphor. So we can point out the ways that we have been impacted, the ways that we hurt. I can talk about the racism I'm impacted by. I can talk about sexism, dot, dot, dot. But it's, really, it's very rare that we are able to confess, to talk about, to name the necks that our feet are on. And you do all know that all of our feet are situated on somebody's neck, right? So this is a big part of my challenge. I wanted to do something different, particularly within a sort of genre of a memoirs who had uh, written by black men. Um, and I knew like that there was a reckoning to be done. And that is not easy work. Like who wants to show their hand? Um, who wants to sort of show, as Kiese Lehman would say, the work? Um, and that was really hard to do. So this book isn't a confession in a sense that it is a languaging of a desire for absolution but rather it's a confession in the sense that is an, it is an entry point, an invitation for the reader to come in, to sojourn, to sit with the interior life of the peoples, of the communities, of the lived experiences, of my life which it explores. I wanna read you a quote from Julie Carr, poet and writer, when talking about her book objects from a borrowed confession. This is what she had to say. When one confesses in a work of literature, there's also the possibility that you're never going to hear any kind of response or engagement. I guess I'm saying that yes, I do believe that in the kind of confession I was looking at in that piece, I love this part, the answer is not what's important. What's important is the saying. In terms of confession, the answer is not what's important. What's important is the saying, the asserting of one's own complex psychology or emotional life. I love that. Because in many ways, that's so smart. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> um, but so much of the work or at least the healing that sort of resulted from the writing of the book had much to do with the ability to just put down on the page that which I have attempted to lock away in so many hidden places in my life, to finally open up those doors and let people in. Not so much because I needed a word to be given to me, not because I was seeking a thing, I needed to give a thing. So I understand confession as an act of hospitality. Second thing, um, in writing the book and confronting so much of the pain that had surfaced as a result of victimization, 
vicarious violence, of betrayal, of my own willful failures and harm doing, of felt relationships. I struggled and ultimately learned a thing or two about what I call costly grace. So confession is sort of one principle around which I was writing. This notion of costly grace is the other. And I should make it, you know, it's a reason why I modify grace. <laughs> because there's a difference between cheap grace and costly grace. Um, a perfect example of what I understand to sort of be a practice of cheap grace is the U.S. Empire's relationship um, as a nation state to the people it has harmed. <laughs> I mean, I probably don't have to go much further than that. <laughs> to accept the sin of state violence as acts that we ought to forget and move on from and sort of attach ourselves to these poetic ideas of justice and equity and freedom and liberty that are divorced from actual histories of subjugation, of violence, not just physical, but ideological, theological, and so much else. Cheap Grace is a white supremacist walking into a black worshiping space while black worshipers are praying and worshiping, and that white supremacist shoots those worshipers dead. And the demand or sort of expectation of, those, of the black mourners is that they ought to pray quickly to absolve and forgive the white supremacists who came in and shot them. That's like cheap grace. Cheap grace is like, you know, we know that slavery existed. And we can apologize for it, but be sure not to ask for repair. Costly grace requires payment. It demands that we not lie about harm done. Because to love is to not lie. It demands that the person or the body that has done harm is clear that they have actually done harm and are willing to be held accountable to a process of repair. It demands the ending of harm done, or as we like to say, do no harm. It demands safety for the inflicted and hope in the possibility of transformative justice. And I wrestled with this, to be quite honest, because I had a lot of incidents that I talked through and wrote through in a book where I'm detailing um, incidences of harm and violence, most of which are centered around my father's um, behaviors and presence in my life. So let me just say a bit about that. So I'm writing a book, um, and I think a few months in, my father dies. And I have this sort of running joke that I talk about this now. Katie knows this. You know, the first thing I thought when I went to see him on, a, on his hospital bed, and he's sitting there, his body's there, and I was told that he is unresponsive. First thing I said is, you absolutely would do this. Like, you would take the easy way out and just dip off and just die before we have a chance to sort of reckon with anything. But what was important about that experience and really sort of having to experience my own type of... Uh, death and an ascension as he's dying um, is that I confronted this complex character human person in a couple ways. One, I talked to my mother who was a direct beneficiary of this man's violence and I said to her, how can you forgive him? Are you going to go to his funeral? And she says, I'm going to go. And I said, well, how? And she said, well, you know, I think about my relationship to this, your father in this way. You might know him um, as a sort of person from one aspect of his life. You got to unfortunately see him en enact a lot of violence. But I choose to remember the fullness of his life. Then this was hard for me to sit with y'all. So she starts giving me all of these examples of the man she knew before he became, or the boy she knew, before he became the man that used his hands to do harm. And she detailed how he 
once tried to save her life and did actually save her life from a person that attempted to sexual assault her in her backyard when she was a kid and he got beat up in the process. She talked about how when she didn't eat, on some occasions that he would go out and find food for her. And she starts going through all of this stuff and she would always pause as she's giving me this, these examples to say, and this is not me forgetting any of what he's done that was wrong. This is me thinking about him in a sort of more fuller human way. Um, and that was super helpful, but you know what else was helpful? It was very clear that on his deathbed, I confronted what was clear to me is that the reason why I was able to um, look at him as a sort of big monster in my imagination, I had turned him into the thing that I was always determined that I would never be, is because it has allowed me to sort of distance myself from the very same features that made me look at him as a monster in the first place. In other words, like as long as he was a monster, it made me feel good about the shit that I was doing wrong. Y'all have anybody like that in your lives? <laughs> you know, the anger sort of like compelled me. I was fueled by this anger. I'm like, as long as I'm not him, you know, like I'm good. I'm not doing X, I'm not doing Y, I'm not doing Z. Therefore, like I must be better. Um, and that was a low hanging fruit. Like that, that, that was it. So in so many ways, those encounters allowed me to think more deeply about this notion of grace, what it means to extend hospitality, what it means to extend forgiveness, what it means to sort of set up systems of accountability that one names harm for what it is, but also holds true the possibility of, of, of people becoming something other than the monsters, monsters we uh, imagine them to be. Um, so I want to read something about my father. After explaining that to you, you would know why writing the, the next pages I'm about to read was so crucial for me. Because um, I didn't imagine I would be able to write him into the book as anything other than the bad person I imagined him to have been. January 15th is a day full of complexity. Every celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birth is another opportunity to highlight the type of college-educated, Christian, married, suit-wearing, and respectable black man society deems worthy of public praise. My father was born in 1961 on the same day as King, but 30 years later, two black men, one an American hero, and the other is proverbial nightmare. America is obsessed with images of the good black man whom niggas should strive to emulate. Forget King's own internal and private conflicts made public by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. Marital infidelity and imperfection aside, the respect reserved for King has much to do with America's fascination with black men it regards as great. Even when those same men have been demonized and killed before their deification. America's relationship with King since his death has been a one-sided love story centered on a man made out to be less human and complex than he actually was. I compared my father to King. My father I thought then was less great, but that is not what I think today as I write and remember his humanity. Boo Boo was a black boy who may have dreamt about a life full of promise, resources, respect, and familial love, but how much of a life free of troubles and self-detestation can a 15-year-old boy concerned with raising an infant build before his sense of self is devoured? How could he withstand the effects of immense poverty, lack of education, lovelessness outside of his home, restrictive rules governing the cold, a thuggish black manhood he performed, quest for internal power to upset the reality of material disempowerment, the lure of the streets, the force of white America's fear induced policing of his body. I don't have any answers, but I imagined the many societal expectations he tried to meet were only magnified by the presence of a woman partner who succeeded where he seemingly failed. I'm gonna skip down. I buried a man who was stuck. He was forever attempting to break away from the world of the black boy who didn't finish grade eight, the one who had a kid at 15, a boy who was pulled in by the lore of the streets, a teen who would later beat the girl he got beat up for protecting, a black man frozen in time. He was a black man who swung back when love sometimes showed up in the form of an embrace. We are the same, like my father and so many other black men. Some of us don't really ask for what we want, 
because to ask for love is to ask for what has been denied us for so long. How many of us want what we have been told we cannot or are not allowed to have? The last words I spoke over his unconscious body as he rested on a hospital bed surrounded by the kids he had left long before were simple. Fly. I know you are heavy. We forgive you. Whatever weight you have been carrying, let them go. Fly. I only told him what I learned to do in his absence. Um, so you all would know then why it was writing that passage was extremely difficult for me. <laughs> Um, because it really is a signal that I had to go through on a journey um, to assessing his fuller humanity, which is to say, think about him within the context of the world in which he came to be. And part of what I had to do was think, who taught a 15-year-old black boy to become a man that, was, that would learn to brutalize using his fist? Um, and that meant that I had to reckon with his world. And that was not about necessarily forgetting what I watched him do, it was putting it into sort of fuller context um, as a way of honoring his humanity, um, which in so many ways to me was to not lie about the fullness of who he was. Lastly, this book is ultimately a meditation on radical love or what I call black love. Um, and I call it, I sort of call it that, and I, I get in trouble for this a lot. You know, like, why is it black love? I don't know. Why do we celebrate? Whatever. I was about to go in, but I'm not. Um, but in so many ways, like, when I think about the, the sort of black struggle for liberation within the context of this nation state, a nation state that espouses an idea of love that it has never practiced, materialized, um, honored in terms of black people, it seems to me um, that the type of love for this nation and the ideas that this nation espouses that comes from a people who has been denied that love is the most honest and pure form of what I would call love at all, if you get what I'm trying to say. Black love to me is, is not just sort of a poetic, um, empty, rhetorical love, but a deeply felt political, material love. Baldwin says, love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is a growing up. Um, and in so many ways, like the way that I think about black love is, has everything to do with the black people I grew up with, right? So these are people, and I say this wherever I go, who resisted disposability. Black folk are always at the ready for disposability. We exist. You come out before you're not before you're not even out of the womb. There is sort of a, a proclivity towards disposability, right? This idea that that black life is to be disposed of, whether that is um, by ordinances and laws, whether that's by the bullets of a police officer's gun. Uh, whether that's by the sort of violent theologies that sometimes can strip us of our personhood and humanity. Um, to be black and alive is to constantly push against this sort of uh, thirst for our disposal. So, but I come from a people who were sort of counter disposability. That is, these were people who had a full house all the time. We had a very little means. And just to describe for you, like the house that I grew up in on 1863 Broadway was very small, three bedrooms, it had a basement, but there were people all over the place, on the floor, on the couch. Like at one point, like I can't get this memory out of my mind, but I'm sleeping on one couch, my mom is on the couch, like an aunt is on the floor. There's a, do y'all know what I'm talking about, people? Okay, right, so like it's a lot of people in the house. And it's a lot of people in the house because when folk would come knocking on the door, whether they needed food or a place to stay, I had the type of family that would make themselves uncomfortable. They would make themselves uncomfortable. They would give up a bed, a sheet, resources for the sake and comfort of another person. But here's the added thing that I, that I always think. Not all of those people were perfect folk that they lived in. You know, like some cousin stole stuff sometimes. 
another aunt or another family member might have um, said that they were going to leave the substances that they were abusing alone, but they didn't. Somebody else didn't pay a child support bill. But you know what? Whenever they knocked on the door, they let them in. This, to me, was like a radical um, sort of type of love that they were practicing, so counter the American project, which is so entrenched in carceral logics, disposability. Here's a people that had taught me something different, that all of us, because at, all of, at some point we're all going to have our feet on somebody's neck, deserve to have a place that we can come home to. My grandfather used to cook this dish called goulash. And I swear, it just changed. the ingredients changed. It looked different every time he cooked it. You know, I actually Googled goulash when I got old enough and Google was around, because I'm like, what the hell is goulash? And he would just call it that. But really what he was making in this sort of like pot, he would take everything. <laughs> First of all, I, I was always amazed that my family members had a way of, of um, creating dinners for, for many, many aunts and cousins and uncles and folk that were staying in these homes. They literally were pulling dinners out of, like, you would look in the cupboards, there would, there would be nothing there, but they would make something out of nothing. Um, that's radical love, right? Um, but it was so clear to me that, like, his intent was it was never really about the taste of the thing. It was about the idea that nobody were, was to leave the house or go to sleep without. This to me is like the first place I understood and learned what love as a politic is. And I, I started thinking as I got older and I started sort of organizing, could you imagine if the way that we approached our policy work if the way that we approach the business of, of community building, if the way that we approach our theologizing was centered in the ethic that a family like mine practiced, which was very basic, you know the ethic. I don't care who you are. No matter what you did. Now, you might have stole something last week, so that means when you come this week, I'm locking everything up but I am not gonna let you go without. Like, could you imagine if that ethic was at the heart of the American project? The type of world that we could be living in. I wanna end just by reading um, about my family. My mom and her siblings exemplify the true meaning of family. They argued and forgave. They were temporary enemies during certain stages of their lives, and they were lifelines during times of need. Lack didn't impede their ability to care for one another. It made care possible. Their, their example taught me why it was and is necessary to reject stereotypes about black people without wealth. They were rich in empathy, support, and compassion. Had we been born into money, I believe we would have revered things our material possessions and our individual selves of false gods of American capitalism and not the people we snuggled up next to in twin sized beds or on living room floors. That powerful form of connections is what critics of Camden missed. People who lived outside of our city ostensibly saw only the social problems that were present on the surface, but they failed to understand and take into account the fundamental everyday ways in which black families like mine demonstrated care within our homes, even when care was not executed from city hall, police headquarters, and a governor's office. Care does not look like police patrolling blighted neighborhoods in search of people who fit the description of the assumed criminal to fill up jail cells and meet quotas, both built on a false premise that black people are more prone to violence. Instead, care looks like neighbors passionately intervening to ensure the safety of people they know and strangers they don't, who have been assailed by police many times for no reason other than the color of their skin. I observed interventions many times as a youth. Care, the kind of support that one gives to push another toward wholeness, is not a consequence of apathy. Welfare legislation 
designed to redeem the poor, whom most people assume loathe worthing and rely on the state for, for handouts is not about care if it isn't grounded in the truth that our American economic system has always purposefully, purposefully favored the rich. Care is my Aunt Arlene stealing food, mindful of the consequences if she were to be caught so her sisters' and brothers' bellies could be a bit more full when they lay down to rest in their beds. My family cared dear, cared deeply in the absence of policies and programs that were grounded in love. As a child, I assumed the world was full of people just like them who loved just as hard and sacrificed just as much. This is why I played more than I worried, worried as a child. It's why I smiled more than I frowned. It's what makes me remember the good nights before the bad mornings. My mom and her people protected me from the truth and taught me that the world outside our door, a short distance away from home, a world inhabited by white people and black people with money may not be hospitable. But I would also learn that the safest spaces like our homes can be hostile. In the last paragraph from the book, Through the Freedom Rides and the subsequent work I've done with the Movement for Black Lives, I've been able to reimagine what a practice of black radical love and justice can look like. In my mind, it looks like my big black family piled up in the tiny house we shared on Broadway and Camden, always full, always saturated with love, always a center of disagreement, always a place of shelter for those on the edges, always a place where one could come to make amends and be forgiven, always a site of imagination where we dreamt of new means of survival in the face of scarcity. When I think about what it takes to move through and escape the many fires blazing and awaiting black people in America, images of my family, whether congregating in our living room in Camden or in a sanctuary of St. John's and St. Louis come to mind, we are the solve, the, the source and the water that quenches the fire. Last um, thing I want to read here is um, something I wrote when I left Princeton Seminary and a colleague there asked me about writing as a spiritual practice. And I actually forgot I wrote this uh, and I found it on a blog that she published. And I should also note that um, I spent many days sort of writing these type of ruminations right in you all's library here. So kudos to you for a dope library. But this is what I wrote in probably 2010. There are moments when I have placed unimaginative and creative words, fragments of statements, and full state sentences on paper, only to erase them out of frustration because they were conjured without a muse, without a source of inspiration. In fact, it's difficult for me to write unless I sense that the words given are traveling from a deep place within, my spirit heart, reservoir of feeling, my life world. A friend once quipped, that friend actually was a student here, Christopher Jones. You write when you are moved as if there are ancestors resting on your soldier, so, shoulder pushing you to write. When they speak, you type. My friend was right. I understand the movements that move me to write as an act of spirit. And my use of spirit here is not intended to connote a transcendent being with the power to fill the human, the empty vessel. But I imagine spirit as a vast plane of collective consciousness and life force, where the here and the, transcend and the transcendent conjoin, where the mundane and extra mundane meet, where we touch each other and the other. In the spirit, creativeness from all these sources can be found. That is what inspires me to write. This practice can be evidenced as a mystical act because it requires that one both leans into oneself for expression and into the expanse of spirit to locate words, logos, expressions, tales, conversations, speech. It requires a type of presence with self and the universe and is therefore a collective undertaking that inspires. It is spirit work. Thank you.
Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Thank you for giving of yourself this evening and giving of yourself in this memoir and in all that you do. I want to jump right in to some conversation okay. with you. I'm going to focus on your book a little bit for a minute. You've self-titled this book, Coming of Age, Black and Free. So I want to sit with this subtitle. <laughs> Now, I've heard you say in other talks and interviews that it is really a book about unbecoming, mm. as indeed you've titled one of the chapters of your book. What do you mean by that? How does that notion of unbecoming relate to this notion of coming of age? Mm. So good. Um, such a good question. That's actually also the title of my second book. <laughs> tentatively. Um, but in, in so many ways, I, I do think that our coming to age journey isn't, uh, has as much to do with um, unlearning, mm -hmm. um, sort of untethering ourselves from um, all of the sort of ideas or, or rules that we have been told we ought to follow. Um, at least for me, I found the route to freedom for me had everything to do with me um, turning all of what I told I, what I was told I was supposed to be, the type of man I was supposed to be, the type of human person I was supposed to be on its head. And I actually think that that is how we get free. In other words, uh, if I commit if I had committed to living my life in a way that uh, acquiesced to all of the ideas, all of the norms that I was told I needed to follow, I would be caged. Mm -hmm. And I was caged as a queer person attempting to fit myself into a box that was not um, big enough to hold the sort of expansive nature of my sexual mm -hmm. expression. Um, I would have been caged as a black person growing up in a certain sort of age and time um, who had received all manner of messages about the type of black boy I was supposed to be. Had I not rejected those ideas, or as I like to say in a less poetic way, given all of those ideas the middle finger, yeah. I one would not be here alive. It's in fact my faith in the ideas that had been circumscribed, or that had been placed on me, I had been socialized into, that had actually been um, why I spent so much of my life toying with the, the, the sort of possibility of not being here. Hmm. And by not being here, I don't mean that poetically, I mean literally not being alive. Um, so if at just that level, if it means that I'm alive because I rejected, failed at, refused, resisted, pushed against, given a middle finger to all those norms, um, and I'm alive to tell the story, that is freedom. So let me stay with that a little bit and relate that to how you talked about your father and how for so long you tried to live over and against who you believed your father was and, and, and who he showed himself to be uh, in much of your life and memories of him. What, what did it mean? How did it feel? What was the moment? What, 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 what was the, that sort of transition, if you will, that transformation for you when you began not to live over and against who he was? but to live into who you could become. It was a, it was a very, uh, oh, I'm glad you, that, that is a good word, transition, transformation, because it was a very like stark moment. I actually remember when I finally let go of the, like I, it became clear to me that so much of the sort of energy source that had been fueling my connection to him was anger. When the anger was gone and I had to sit with hurt and pain are, are really become the eight-year-old boy who, had st who was 
upset, not really angry, but upset and, and heartbroken. Mm -hmm. Because inside of this 40 some plus year old person was this eight year old boy that was really ever only waiting for his dad to come back and said, I see you. Hmm. Um, so the moment that the anger was gone, I was like, oh, what am I gonna do? Because the thing that was um, grounding or at least um, fueling sort of my resistance against him was no longer there. <laughs> It was like the jig was up, you know? And um, also during the writing process, as I'm sort of like having these moments of self-reflection and really um, coming clean with my deep investment in patriarchy, the benefits that I received and even if I had, even after having an analysis or a lens to see how it was working in my life, still better, you know, like, you know, you, you get black, you have feminist dudes who talk a good game that's right. about patriarchy. But so we use those words and it's like, you ain't really doing shit to like change, the, you know, this material circumstances in your life are structured such that. The, so I think at that moment, I'm like, you know, we, we, I wrote in the book something along the lines of, we are of the same stuff. And how dare I hold him, you, to this sort of um, standard that I was not willing to hold myself to. Mm -hmm. And I was having this kind of, you know, this sort of thought within a larger framework of this sort of justice oriented movement where we are all talking about justice and I think we, all, we may mean some fundamentally different things when we say justice. Right. We are in a Me Too movement moment. There's a lot of reckoning happening, uh, movement for black lives. So justice is being thrown out and in some, for some folk, justice means carcerality. Right. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having to do the hard work of wrestling with what that means. Like, is that really justice? Yeah, exactly. The justice that I'm imagining, you know, is, you know, an abolitionist future. Mm -hmm. Or as Ruthie Wilson Gilmore would say in talking about abolition, it's not just a removal of the shit that doesn't work of the systems that don't work, the things that don't work. It's imagining into being the things that need to go in a place of the stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> so justice for me means living into an abolitionist future where jails are not the final resort, our final word for managing violences, our things of the heart, our matters of harm. That, so I guess, I don't know how I got here in this sort of line of thinking, but in so many ways I, I kept thinking, so for the people who have harmed me, what would justice look like? And all I could come, come up with is change of heart, change of mind, a new sort of lens to sort of understand the world and their relationship to it, an ending of the violences that they may have committed. And if I can imagine that for myself, then I certainly would need to sort of practice mm -hmm. or hold myself to that vision um, as well. So there's so many places that I want to <laughs> pick up from there, but let me start with this word violence and violences. And your book, opening pages, within the opening pages of this book, you're talking about a period, I guess, five years before you were uh, born. Oh my goodness, and I was uh, studying that in college, this period you're talking about, the, where, where, where you're talking about where Horatio Jimenez, or uh, also known as Rafael Gonzalez in 1971, uh, was murdered uh, by two police officers and it created, uh, led to the uprisings uh, in Camden, New Jersey at that time. And that was a reflection in so many ways of the sort of structural and systemic uh, cultural uh, and complicated realities of violence that also impacted your family and impacted all of the uh, social interactions for not only yourself but for others. And you say in your book that the real tragedy of living with routine acts of violence is the way each act deadens emotions. Can you speak to what it means for violence to deaden emotions? And how were you able to resurrect your emotions again? Oh, wow. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm often thinking about how we as human persons develop so many coping mechanisms, our ways to sort of deal um, with, with, with what life offers us. So looking back, I'm, 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 you know, and we, to not feel is a feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I'm imagining as a young person, and I'm, I reflect on this a lot, at some point, it was the only way that I could deal with having lost so many people, all of whom were like under 18 in such, such a quick, short amount of time. Um, and to sort of not feel, or at least to sort of give myself the illusion of non-feeling. Mm -hmm. Help me to deal. You know, what do you say to a young person? And I, I, I battle with this today. What do you say to a young person that can um, who's been to, I don't know, 10 home-going funeral services before they're 16. And the people that they're burying are, um, haven't, many of them are, haven't been over 18 years old. I mean, I remember one time I lost three friends at one time. Hmm. They were 16 and 15 in a car accident. Maybe two weeks later, I lost another friend who was shot. He was 16. Uh, maybe a month later after that, you know, a friend who was laying with me on my couch, literally laying on the other end of the couch, find, you know, with fondling each other's feet, shot, dead in the street. Like, all of this is happening. And in the same way that trauma blunts emotions, or sort of creates this sort of wall that if we, if we don't um, manage it or attend to it, becomes something of a border, like a strong, a stronghold. Um, Often it's the case that we develop those walls in order to cope and to deal. And I literally got to the point where I could no longer cry. Hmm. Um, that's not because of a lack of empathy. It's not because of a lack of sort of humanity. It's, it's the result of, um, of the perpetual, mm -hmm. ever-present sort mm -hmm. of face and hand of violence. But how does one heal through that? Um, I can clearly remember, I th like there were moments where, where I cried and <laughs> like, I, they're so clear to me because they were so rare. Like there, these were like uh, pivotal moments when I allowed myself, um, to be fully human. And let me just say this with black people in particular. And when I'm thinking about the black folk in Camden, you know, like, for black people in the context of the U.S. who have had to struggle or at least attempt to sort of attain or um, fall into this category of the human, um, to, to, to be seen as, as fully human, that is to hurt, to feel pain, um, to experience joy, um, is something that, you know, it makes sense to me how, why it is that there, there are struggles around not only being sort of seen as fully human, but what it means to be allowed and allowing ourselves to be, and as black people who are socialized as men. Mm -hmm. So healing for me was like, you know, um, at least therapy. <laughs> um, and coming clean with the fact that uh, so much Therapy also sort of like the critical writings and analysis that had been offered to me that allowed me to understand that so much of what we had experienced in places like Camden were not just because of the lack of virtue present within the people, but so much of the structural violences begat mm -hmm. some of the others. Um, and being cl coming clean with the fact that uh, we have a right to not be okay. Yeah. There was a moment where I just was like, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Black, and for black people, I don't know if we, we don't have that. Yeah, but we don't, well, we don't have the luxury of not being okay, right? <laughs> and black kids don't have the luxury of being kids. Right. Uh, it reminds me as you talk about that and, and being able to cry and being human, it reminds me of a story that Howard Thurman mm -hmm. uh, would tell where uh, a little white boy came up to him, he was in his yard doing something, and with a needle and stuck in with the needle and said, I just wanted to see if you all hurt, mm. right? Mm. That's this, this whole sense that you aren't human. But 
by the time people see the violence, you know, as you talk about uh, burying uh, three of your friends in a short period of time, or the violence that uh, by the time it's on the streets and taking lives where people see them, there's violence that people have ignored, mm -hmm. that people don't see. The, the violence of poverty mm -hmm. that, you know, black and brown children are disproportionately subjected to. And I always remember what Fieri, Polo Fieri said, that oppressed people can't initiate violence. Mm. And so when people talk about stopping the violence, mm. they aren't talking about stopping the day-to-day, -day, as you say, that routine violence, the tragedy of that routine violence that truly does blunt the emotion. What, how do we stop that violence? How do we get people to see that violence? What, speak to that. Oh, wow, that's a <laughs> Remake the world? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, you know, um, I, I, I often say I, 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 we are so attracted to lies. Yeah. We, we, we love them. Um, so, you know, when I hear that, I, I hear, how do we get people to sort of want to wrestle with, sit with, reckon with the truth? Mm -hmm. And I'm, y'all, I mean, I, I, I like to say I'm hopeful. I really do. Um, and I've really, really like fought myself because I don't want to be like, you know, that person with like a dystopic vision, you know, um, a pessimist. But I often think if I have to work that hard, if I have to work that hard, if I have to just think of new creative ways to use my words, the use of my body for a disruptive dis act of disruption, if I have to work that hard to get human beings to, feel, to inevitably feel mm -hmm. compassion, empathy, empathic regard for, um, and have an analysis for folk other than themselves. That's a, that, that's a horrible state right. of being. So I, I wrestle with this question. I mean, part of the only thing I can ever say is to tell the th truth. Yep. 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 And, and, I, and it sounds so trite, but it's like, we do not tell the truth enough. And the only thing that I, I mean, to, to, and, and to do so is to actually love. It is to actually, like, it's an act of love. I would not lie to the thing that I love. I'm telling, you know, I'm, so, but even in our truth telling, I mean, we'll look at the moment that we're in right now. Right. It's precisely because of truth telling on a grander scale and a bunch of other things um, that allowed the pendulum to swing such that you have this impulse to protect what this nation feels like is being taken from them. And you will vote into office. <laughs> that. That. <laughs> All you can say is that. Um, but you know, right. we voted that into office precisely right. out of that's right. these things that we're talking about, right? So, I mean, maybe it's telling, and then, you know, I'm, I'm often thinking about what it means for us to model within the spaces that we have available to us. Like I talked about my family, um, all other ways of being. How do we sort of uh, body into being that abolitionist future that we, that we can only sort of move toward? This aspirational yeah. vision. Yeah. Um, but well, you know what? Even as you talk, what about, do you think about this? Well, no. Well, he's, when you talk about that which this nation voted into office, and we'll get to this other part in my question in a minute, that the majority of white Christian America, by yes. the way, voted for, not just yeah. evangelicals. That that's the lie that people said. Yes, eighty some percent of white evangelicals voted for that, mm -hmm. but uh, in that vision, right? But so too did 
50 some percent of non-evangelical white Protestants and 60 percent of white Catholics. So the majority of white Christian America right. voted for this. So let's first tell the truth about that. But I think as you speak about this vision that was voted into office and this man uh, that was voted into office, we need to reckon with the truth that he, em he embodies of who this nation is. Mm -hmm because he's speaking a truth. He embodies a truth of who we are. And until we reckon with that, then we won't be able to move toward, right, this place where violence is not enacted on people simply because of who they are. Yes. So that, that, that's, that's my interest. I'm gonna talk about another kind of violence that you talk about in your book. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by calling some names. Dana Martin, Jazlyn Ware, Ashante Carmen, Claire Legato, Malaysia Booker, Michelle Tamika Washington, Paris Cameron, Chanel Lindsay, Chanel Skurlock, Zoe Spears, Brooklyn Lindsay, Denalis Berries Stuckey, Tracy Single, Marquez Kiki Fontroy, Pebbles Ladine Doy, Jordan Coffer, Bailey Reeves, B. Love Slater, Angelique. Ja Leia Jamar. These are the names of the 19 known transgender persons killed this year, 18 of which are black transgender women, with Jalila Jamar having been murdered just this past Friday in Kansas. Indeed, of the known transgendered people killed this year, 13 have died from gun violence. Of the more than 150 known victims of anti-transgender violence from 2013 to the present, two thirds of those killed were victims of gun violence. Yet, this is the violence about which we do not speak let alone speaking about the anti-LGBTQ bullying violence that teens like 15-year-old Nigel Shelby are bombarded with on a daily basis that led him to complete suicide. You, in your book, make clear that silence is violent. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful that we, I, I hate that we have to name those names, um, but I I'm, I'm just want to honor the presence of what I call, you know, the congregation of the dead. And um, so uh, a big part, a, a big impetus for, for writing this book, and um, Beryl Satter's here, raise your hand. So Beryl's here, and this is my sister, friend, and mentor. Um, when I was, had a draft, many drafts of a book, um, so much of what had um, been my guidepost for writing had to do with um, writing a book to honor young people young queer and trans folk who had been murdered. And, and then I was writing really to, so, to sort of reckon with the lived experiences of young queer and trans and non-binary folks' lives. And what was really clear to me was that I had been in communities and particularly organizing communities that did a really good job at having uh, single variable political frameworks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, y'all know what I mean by that. So it's like, I'll show up at the anti-violence march in Newark 
But, you know, when we say, oh, you all are about to do this anti-violence march, and you're about to walk out and name folk that have been murdered on these streets, Sakia Gunn's name, a 15-year-old lesbian, needs to be out there. And they say, oh, that's not, what we, that's not the work we're doing. <laughs> or when, you know, we're, we're, we're in the throes of, of a movement for Black Lives moment, and we have these Black Lives Matter shirts on, and we're on Twitter, and we're talking about the trans sisters who were so brave to join communities of mostly cisgender leaders because, you know, we were all on the microphone. Um, and who had to say, I rarely come to spaces like this because one, I don't feel safe, but I'm here. So when we say, you know what, they need to have space to sort of name and to lead. And you have people say that that's not, this is distracting us from the real work of police abuse impacting black men. Or when we're at the sort of pride march, when I'm standing on Christopher Street two years ago, and we're having a great time and I'm in a crowd of mostly white LGBTQIA and, ally, and allied folk who start booing when the Black Lives Matter contingent mm -hmm. shows up and disrupts the pride parade. Like, the, the, so I'm, it isn't just that silence is violence. There's a way in which our complicities in this, and I'm, and I'm here, I'm not even talking to the people that, you know, quote unquote, don't know better. I'm really invested and really invested in wrestling with folk who name themselves as a type of progressive, liberal, feminist, whatever, um, whose politics fall flat mm -hmm. because of their failure to be expansive and open themselves up um, to see uh, the sort of full range of violences impacting all of us and to not name that not only to not name what's happening to those individuals, to what ha to, to name to what have happened to them, but to not also name our complicities mm -hmm. in their demise um, is itself a violent act. Let me, before we turn to question and answers, uh, questions to be honest, let me ask you one more thing. Let's turn. We're in this seminary. Let's say something about the church. <laughs> just as I say, just a, just a little, little something, something. So let me ask you <laughs> this, <laughs> right? And, and I always say when we use that term church, it's aspirational because very few of the places which call themselves church are church, but I'm just saying. One black religious leader once said that you can be a whole lot of things in the black church, but Lord, he said, Lord have mercy, don't be gay. Others have described the black church as an open closet. It seems as some of the ways the black church and the various ways in which you interacted with it and talked about it in your church, uh, in your book, that perhaps it was uh, an, an open closet. Furthermore, you said that the black church did more to shore up faulty notions of manhood and patriarchy then push you toward liberation. Yet at the same time, you speak to, about the church, churches in which you felt peace. So clearly, as we both know, the black church, it loves and it takes, right? But the black church is a complex, complicated reality. What are we to say, what are you to say about the black church today? Especially as we think about the realities of the Nigel Shelby's and the Jalea Jamars of the world for which the black church is not necessarily a sanctuary. Yes, a few things. One, um, I, I would revise that, I, I, I would do some revision. Um, if I had a chance in the book to be very clear to talk about black churches. Mm -hmm. um, or did you say African, you know, African American denominational churches, right? Like plural, there's not a monolith. Um, one, because I think what that does, it invis invisibilizes many of the worshiping spaces that are contending against, um, are, are doing worship differently. Mm -hmm. 
are theologized in the more radical ways, and more liberatory ways. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, you know. <laughs> oh, well. But here's what, what I think. And, you know, I get in trouble for saying this, but as someone who has had a chance to see or at least discern and witness how spirit is moving outside of these church houses. Um, <laughs> my sense is that a lot of the, a lot of the buildings that exist. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I know a lot of the buildings that exist where people are going because they believe this is where they are finding God. Um, when in fact, I do believe that the spirit has, has had to meet so many of us outside of those buildings, um, that that itself is, is a critique yeah. of, of willful, of a, I mean, there's so much to say here. Um, the collusion with this sort of present sort of political ideas um, the collusion and or love of capitalism and capitalist greed, um, the sort of deeply, deeply neoliberal foundations of so many church practices and theologies. And let me be clear that the black church, if it is having these problems, it is because it exists within a nation, within a context that itself is the problem, right? So I don't want to talk about the black church as if it's an anomaly. It exists in white supremacist hetero patriarchal, hetero cap, hetero cis hetero patriarchy. Cis -patriarchy. Um, so like it, it exists within that, yeah. And at the same time, let me just say this one thing about like, and I wrote this about this in the book. When we were in um, when the, that this Black Lives Matters riot happened, it was 500 or so um, young people. Many of whom have, a lot of whom were former seminary grads, some were in seminary, some were, um, were churched but left the church. Um, but I remember we were organized in a worshiping space in St. John's, and I remember people said, I'm not going to go to church. But it was so clear to me that God had met these 500 folk on the streets where they were executing a vision, where they were attempting to sort of articulate and execute a vision of social justice. Um, and in so many ways, doing, living out the gospel, living it out, becoming um, bread for people, literally becoming resource for others. And that is where I found hope that spirit, is, it isn't that spirit is moving. It's just that you don't have to find it here. You know, and spirit is moving in, in some of the most phenomenal places. Um, and these places, I think, signal us very, uh, they are a material critique. A material critique of what so many of, uh, of, of not just the black churches and definitely some of them, <laughs> what they are failing, a critique of what they are failing to sort of, um, to adhere to and actualize in terms of their practices. You don't have to apologize. I say amen to that. You don't have to apologize to that, right? Everything that calls itself church ain't church. And so the question becomes, where do you find church? And what you're saying to us is that church is not necessarily inside those buildings. Church was going on outside where those 500 young people and others are fighting for justice. And in the clubs. In the clubs. In and so many places. That's right, right? And so, uh, and then it's up to those places that may think they're church to be to find church mm -hmm. where it is and find God where God is acting. So thank you for that. Are there questions um, from the audience? Is it? Well, yes. Muhammad. <laughs> so 
So you mentioned the book Freedom Dreams earlier tonight. And I wanted to ask, how have your dreams of freedom evolved and changed over your years? And what freedom are you imagining into being today? Muhammad asked the best questions. <laughs> I've been asking good questions all day. It's so great. Um, how have my freedom dreams evolved? It's the, the sort of center, or at least the, the grounds of my dreams have changed. Um, I have, uh, I've been challenged to think about my own sort of location in the freedom dreams. I often ask crowds, and I ask myself this, who's alive in your freedom dream? Who's absent? And what I've discovered at, um, after having asked myself that so many times is that the answers have changed. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, um, with the insular nature of my own political formation and my political vision. Um, a lot of the changes that have come from being in community with folk who have allowed me to see, uh, to uh, have access to other ways of being. Um, so in that way, like freedom is, a, the dreams that I have are, are much more expansive and totally con like everything that patriarchy isn't. Everything that, you know, the sort of entrenched forms of anti-blackness and white, uh, the sort of love of white normativity isn't. Everything that sort of visions are, are at least ways of being that are constricted by cis heteropatriarchy isn't. Like, I just want people, I want, for myself to be unfettered in every way possible. And in so many ways, um, that's what like, I want for other people. Um, lastly, you know, you hear me talk about abolitionism a lot, and I, I, I often have to sort of name what I mean by abolitionism. But I often say we don't really have a lot of us time to dream because we're so busy fighting to live in the nightmare that so many people have been bequeathed. Um, that said, when I think about a freedom dream, that freedom dream must be a consequence of an abolitionist project. That is, the, a remaking of the world as we know it, a, restru a remaking of, a dismantling of those systems and a rebuilding, a reimagining and construction of something that is better than what we have now. Can I follow up on that and, uh uh, of Muhammad's question and, and your response makes me think of something that Audre Lorde uh, said and she said that the true focus of revolutionary change which I know this quote is never merely the oppressive situations from which we try to escape but that freeing ourselves from that piece of the oppressor yeah. that is inside of us what? And we all wrestle, I wrestle with that. What's, what's that piece of the oppressor that's inside of you that you still wrestle with? Oh my, so many pieces. I know. Um, so many, you know, I, I, I am, Mark Anthony Neal says, he, we were just um, in discussion last week and he, we were talking about toxic masculinity and he said, you know, in the same way that people will go into AA or NA and say, I'm a recovering dot, dot, dot. He's like, you know, I am a, I am a patriarch in recovery. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's so smart. That's right. Um, and and uh, all of those things that we laid out, you know, white, cis, hetero, patriarchy, uh, sort of a capitalist group, like all of that is like we're, we are socialized into that and I often you know if it take if it took me all of these years to hate the color of my skin mm -hmm. the size of my nose the shape of my lips the movement of my body the ways that I love um, all of these ideas that are you know structured by uh, anti-black racism and sexism and and queer antagonism if it took, like 
I, w- I, I put my faith in those ideas. Mm-hmm. And then it takes that much longer for me to free myself from them. And that is every day work, every day. You know, I go places and they like, particularly when I'm talking about like feminism, it's so silly. Like, I, I, you see my shirt, you know? And I'm in these places and I'm talking about feminism. They're like giving me like applause. And I'm like, y'all doing it because like I'm a dude. Yeah, all right. And part of what my challenge is is to recognize that because I'm certain that some non male identified person has said the same exact thing mm-hmm. a million times better, much more brilliantly, and y'all sitting up here and you either, you know, attack them or sit there quietly without I don't deserve applause for doing for not doing to women what brings them harm. Right. You know, I don't deserve applause for that. So that's my work. Like my work is analyzing the next of my feet is on. And that's just a part of it. Like I always say the real work is taking your feet off right. after you figure out that it's on somebody's neck. I got the sign of almost time's up. So I got to ask you the last question. And that is really, you're in the room now of future religious leaders. <laughs> what do you want them to gain from your story? You say the hardest question for last. That's so hard. Who I can't end with that. That's like, what do I don't know? Oh, that's so good. What do I want them to leave? What? So, you know, I, I talked about confession and radical love. Um, I think future for religious as someone who was a leader in in various capacities in the church, one of the main things I struggled with is um, you know, Henry Nowen talks about the wounded healer, but I I think it's something more precise than that that I'm trying to get at. Um, I think the world is demanding our needs of, of, of people who can un sort of collar themselves Do y'all know what I'm like? In so many ways, that collar is like a metaphor. <laughs> it's a cloak. I'm, I'm using this as a metaphor for a cloak, uh, a metaphor for what it means to hide our authentic selves. And I'm not just talking about like the, the sort of stuff at the surface. Um, I, I, and there is a way that that healers, people who sort of are deemed as healers are expected to show up and to have everything together, um, to have all the answers, to not be recipients of the very messages that they are giving out. <laughs> and, and I really, and you know, I was, I've been haunted recently specifically by the number of healing uh, healers who have, you know, there's a story about a person who was running the counseling office at UPenn who just ended his life. And I, so much of this angst comes from this way that we want to sort of put this collar on and let that lead our walk ahead of us. But people need human interaction. They need, they, you know, like the most angelic thing that we can do is to show up as our authentic selves, to show up as people who reckon with self first. And I am certain that we haven't done a good job of that. Um, I feel like so many ways I would love parts of our, our, that the child in us, the wounded parts in us, <laughs> to, to sort of step out of us. And we need to minister to that first. Thank you. <laughs> There are books in the back and you may purchase a book and uh, I hope Darnell will graciously sign them. Thank you. <laughs>